to answer any questions you would like about it. So, like I said, the life cycle for eels is mysterious and crazy. So to start us off, eels are born as these little tiny leaf-like creatures called leptocephali. And they're about this big and they look like a tiny little leaf. And they are born, has anyone heard of the Bermuda Triangle? You can go ahead, raise your hand if you've heard of it. Um, so in the Bermuda Triangle, there's a place called the Sargasso Sea. And that's pretty close to Florida. So here we have the Atlantic Ocean. And here is our United States. Here's Florida. And here's us in the Hudson River. The start of the Hudson River is right here. So in the Bermuda Triangle around here, there's a place called the Sargasso Sea, right here. And this is where scientists believe that eels are born. Now I say believe because we're not actually 100% sure where eels come from. Um, back in the 1940s, a scientist hopped on a boat and went along the Atlantic Ocean and dipped a net into the ocean to try and find the smallest eel that he could. And when he did, he found these leptocephali. And so that's the only evidence that we have that the eels are actually from there. We've never seen eels reproduce or be born in nature or in a controlled setting. It's never been seen. It's really cool. <laughs> so when these eels are born and they're at their little leafy leptocephali stage, they actually can't swim on their own at all. They have no motor function, it's called. So what they do is, has anyone seen Finding Nemo, the movie? You can raise your hand. Do you guys remember when there was a part with the sea turtles and they were taking the EAC and it was kind of like an ocean highway? So we have the same thing of an ocean highway, but it's called something different. It's called the Gulf Stream. And so these eels, they take the Gulf Stream from the Sargasso Sea along the coast and they stop off at the Hudson River, right where we are. And that whole journey takes about a year. And so after they have done this little um, ocean highway journey, they now look different. Do they stop any other places? That's a great question. They do stop at other places. So they stop all along the coast and they even go further past the Hudson River. They go all the way up to Maine, Nova Scotia. They travel a very long distance away, but there is a very big population that comes to the Hudson River and the Hudson River is where we all are. So we wanna learn about the eels right here. It's really amazing. You can just go out. A lot of fisher, fisher people actually see a lot of eels when they go fishing. So we'll talk about that soon, but great question. So once the eels get to the Hudson River, they're now in their second stage of life called the glass eel stage. And so this is the glass eel. And you can see it's called a glass eel because their skin is completely see-through. So you can see the eyes in their head, their skull, their spine. You could even see their heart beating if you looked hard enough. And I actually have some glass eels to show you today. So they are glass eels, so they're tiny and see-through, but I'll see how well I can show you them. So here are our little glass eels. You can see them swimming around. And if they stayed still, or if we put some drops of clove oil in this water, they would stay still. Um, and we would be able to look at them under a microscope even and watch their hearts beat. And we could even see what they last ate in their stomachs. It's really cool. So we have a program with the DEC called the um, Hudson River Eel Project. And that's where this shirt comes from. And what we do is we monitor the population of these baby eels, these one-year-old eels, um, to see how many are coming into our Hudson River every year. 
to see how their population's doing, whether it's increasing, decreasing, whether we need to help them. Um, and it is really lovely to see all of these little guys every year. But Kate, during yeah. non-COVID times, can people get involved in this project from the community? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you can get involved even this year if you really wanted to. We might still have some spots open if you give me an email. Um, but we have 14 sites all along the Hudson River during non-COVID time, 14 sites. And we work with thousands of volunteers every year. Um, because of COVID this year, we're looking at maybe 60 years. Um, do the effects of clove oil wear off? They do. So clove oil, I mentioned before, is a way to anesthetize eels or knock them out. It's, it's like um, laughing gas for humans. Um, and so we use that sometimes to look at eels under microscopes or dissecting scopes just to inspect their bodies, see how they're doing. And actually with glass eels, it's very interesting. They gain what's called pigmentation or color in their skin. And you can actually watch this process happen uh, throughout this eel life cycle. So the glass eel stage is two out of five life stages of the eel. And so I'll show you. Uh, we'll continue along our glass eel journey or our American eel journey. So the next stage after glass eel is an elver. So this elver, the, the glass is a little bit dirty, but you can see this elver is now about two to three years old. And this is the next stage of life in the eel. And so let me show you, let me try and show you next to each other. There's the elver, here's the glass eel. And you can see these elvers are a lot bigger than the glass eels. They're two, three times as big. And what I was saying before, the color in their skin. Now this eel has completely transformed. It's no longer glass. It now has pigmentation. And so when you look at these little eels underneath the microscope, you can actually see dots on their skin forming because they're getting closer and closer to their next stage in life. And so a lot of scientists used to think that the, the gaining of pigmentation or color in their skin uh, was because they were getting older, but it's actually how much fresh water they're exposed to. So eels are a, what's called a catadromous fish, which means that they live half of their life in the ocean and half of their life in freshwater, like the Hudson River. And so the longer these eels are in fresh water, the more pigmentation they gain, the more they continue on their journey to becoming an adult. It's really cool. Eels are such a mysterious species, right? And so, We've got two life stages left of these eels. And again, this is about two to three years old. So the next life stage is actually the one that they spend the most time in. And this is the one that most people are familiar with. This is called the yellow eel stage. And I have a yellow eel right here, a big, beautiful one. Now this eel, well, these eels, stay in this life stage for up to 10 years. And that whole time they're living in the Hudson River, um, by now they've traveled all the way up and have found a nice little home for itself where it can gobble up as much food as possible because it knows that soon it will be going back to the ocean for its final life stage and to lay its eggs and die off. And so this yellow eel, I, I get a lot of questions. What do eels eat? Um, these eels are called a generalist eater, uh, which basically means they will eat whatever they can fit their mouths around. So they'll eat other eels, small fish, crustaceans, anything at all that they can munch their mouth around. 
And so after this stage, and this is the, this life stage that a lot of fisher people can um, hook on their on their um, their fishing lines um, or catch in nets. Um, and this is actually the life stage if you ever eat eel sushi. This is the life stage of the eel that you're eating. It's this ex same exact species. Um, and so it's really cool that these eels are present everywhere in our lives. And so, like I said, these, these yellow eels are gobbling up as much food as possible because their next stage of life, <laughs> their next stage of life is called the silver eel stage. And actually what happens is their insides dissolve and change. So they dissolve their digestive system or the organs inside that help them eat and it gets changed into their reproductive system. So they no longer eat for the rest of their lives when they're silver eels. Um, and all they can do is go back home to the Sargasso Sea to reproduce, right? It's crazy. Aren't eels insane? And so here I have some visualizations for us. So this yellow eel, she's not full grown yet. I would guess maybe she's about five years old. Um, and again, they can live up to 10 years in this life stage and around 15 years in total. So here's what a full grown yellow eel looks like. I'll move this lovely volunteer to the side for now. So this is what a full grown yellow eel looks like. It's pretty big, right? This is about the size of a full grown silver eel. It's about twice as big, super long, and it's represented pretty well here. You can see the difference in the eyes. So, and here I can show you on a more lifelike picture as well. So here's our silver eel, very big eyes, super long body. And here's our yellow eel. You can see the difference in the eyes. And that's because now they're gonna be in the ocean. And so the ocean, when they swim along um, back to the Sargasso Sea, they actually go up and down and up and down all day. And that's because they have a two types of coloration on their body. The top is pretty dark, silver. That's why we call it a silver eel. And the bottom is very light. And that's because when they're going up and down on the ocean, predators are seeing them from two different ways. They're either looking down, looking for some food, or looking up and looking for some food. So when the predators look down and they see the dark, the dark backs of the eels, they blend in really well with the rest of the ocean floor, which is also really dark. And when predators look up towards the sky, towards the top of the ocean, they see this really light underbelly that blends in really well with the sun and the top of the water. So it's really good camouflage their entire lives, all they're doing is trying to blend in and avoid predators. So it's very cool, very interesting. <laughs> and this silver eel stage, I've never seen personally. Um, I don't know many people who have, just because it's very hard to catch them on their way out. But that is the amazing life of the eel, the life cycle of the eel. Do we have any questions or I can tell you more about eels? Rick has seen silver eels. Really? That's awesome. That's really cool. Was it huge? Do they ever swim on the surface? That's a great question. Here, let me open up this chat box. So do they swim on the surface? That's a great question. Um, they do. They do swim on the surface, and um, I'm not sure if you mean the surface of the water or um, on land, but I'll answer both. So throughout the entire eel life stage, while they're in the Hudson River, they're actually 
living um, in the benthic region, or it's really called the bottom of the, of the rivers is benthic. Um, so they like to live along the bottom. You can see pretty well um, in all of these eels, actually. I'll show you our elver again. You see how this elver is really only swimming along the bottom? It's like even skimming on the, on the ground of it. And that's because the same thing with the, with the silver eel, these uh, elvers have a coloration. They're kind of brown, brownish, yellowish. Um, and that's to mimic the color of mud or rocks. And so what they do is they, they slither along the bottom, nuzzling their heads into different crevices and into the mud and rocks so that they can hide um, because they don't wanna be seen by predators. They're not an aggressive species at all. Um, they really prefer hiding. And they're actually one of the only fish species that can swim backwards. So maybe I can make this eel swim backwards if I give it a little poke. Oh, you see? Swim backwards a little bit. And that's to, um, that's to avoid predators. And so a lot of people also um, ask about their mucus layer because they are a very slimy species. Um, and some people think that the mucus is also to um, avoid predation or to escape predators, but it's actually um, to help avoid or fight against diseases. So that mucus layer protects them from different bacteria that they don't want inside their body, which is really great adaptation, something that they, something that they learn to do. Um, what else there are questions? How do you tell the difference between male and female eels? That's also a really awesome question. So eels actually don't develop a sex. They don't develop their male or female reproductive organs until their last stage in life. Like I said before, is that yellow eel going to jump out the bowl? I have a lid on it, so it wants to, but- not. It's certainly gonna try. <laughs> it's gonna try, absolutely. <laughs> um, so they don't develop a sex until they are silver eels. And when they do it, it's actually really interesting. So their um, gender or their sex is determined by density. So they don't decide actually um, if they're gonna be a male or a female until they get a good understanding of the resources that are available to them. Um, because for example, um, being a female eel or being a female in almost any species, it takes a lot more energy and a lot more resources um, to create those eggs and give birth to them, to them. And not in the eels cases, but in other animals cases um, to care for the young afterwards. And so what's really interesting with eels, if there is a very dense amount of eels and a very low amount of resources, most of them will actually turn male because it's a, a low chance of them surviving if they're female. But if there is a good amount of resources, not a very high density of eels, then a lot of them will be female or they'll be a more even balance. Um, so it, that's really cool. And also a really important um, part in their ecosystem you know, determining whether or not there's enough food for them to have babies or not, which is really cool. Um, and also a study was done on what happens to eels when they are trapped at the bottom of dams, um, because that's been a really big issue with a lot of eels. And one of the big reasons why their population has been going down is because these um, humans are creating barriers like dams and eels can't get around them because they're flat walls. They could get up, they could even climb up um, waterfalls, no problem. Um, but dams, because they're flat walls, they can't really slither up them. And so what these researchers found was that if a big group of eels are trapped at the base of a dam, they will all cannibalize. So they'll all eat each other, but they'll also all turn male because they're all trapped right there. So crazy stuff, yeah, yeah. Uh, we had a question from yeah. Amanda about what is your favorite life stage of an eel? 
That is a really great question, Amanda. And also, Amanda is a friendly face. Um, we have worked together before with eels. Um, and I would say that's a tough question. I'm a little biased towards that question because right now we are in the thick of glass eel season. Um, yesterday, we asked 4,000, almost 5,000 eels in one of our nets yesterday. So I love seeing the glass eels, especially thousands of them at a time. I mean, look at these little things. They are so cute and precious. Imagine thousands of them in a bucket. I mean, wouldn't you just wanna dip your hands in and pull up a puddle full of eels? So I would have to say, that glass eels or elvers, because we do catch elvers too. But the younger ones are, are my favorite life stage because they're just they're just great to play with. <laughs> they're really How fun. long did it take you to count 5,000 eels? A long time. Because <laughs> you have to count them one by one. Um, but it's not too bad because you can actually fill up a net, like a little dip net, a bunch of eels. And if you put your hand underneath, they'll actually on their own. So you don't really have to do much. You just have to hold them and count them as they go out on their own. So at least they help, you know, <laughs> it's not just me on my own. Also, we do have a really great arsenal of volunteers, um, but it does take quite a long time. <laughs> it does. <laughs> so from Donna, we just got another question, but first, uh, do they become silver eels in the river before going to the Sargasso Sea, or does that happen on their journey? That's a great question. I'm not 100% sure what happens um, at the last stage of their life. It's actually the silver eel stage or the transition between the yellow eel and the silver eel um, is the stage that I'm most unfamiliar with. Um, but I would, if I had to guess, I would say that the probably the silver eel stage starts happening while they're still in uh, the river or still in freshwater. And as they get closer to saltwater, to the ocean, um, the life stage continues and then finishes. Um, so I think it is kind of a process, not really a switch that happens, um, but kind of the reverse of glass eels becoming elvers, if that makes sense. That's my guess. Um, how long can an eel live out of water? So this is actually a really great, great question for multiple reasons, but I have a fun story to tell about this. Um, oh, the change starts to happen in freshwater before they leave tributaries. Nice, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, awesome, I guessed correctly. <laughs> Um, so, how long can an eel live out of the water? Pretty long is, is the short of it. Um, so eels, so I mentioned that they can actually slither up waterfalls, right? Because with their bodies, they, they use their bodies and the crevices of rocks and things to help them fight the water. And they like fighting the water too. They, they're kind of like salmon. They like going against the stream rather than towards it. And so they're actually able to slither up those waterfalls. But for dams, like I said before, they're trapped there, right? But there have been certain inst instances or certain dams where eels can actually swim on land or slither along the land and physically go around the dam from the land um, because they have that mucus layer. So they can really withhold that moisture and be able to last without that. Um, eels can actually last a really long time out of water compared to other fish. Um, I would say maybe three times as long, four times as long as your common fish is how long they can last because of that mucus layer. I have a really fun story actually. So my boss, we have eel, um, eel tanks at our office, right? I'm in our office right now. Um, this is 
I'm at Nori Point Environmental Center in Statsburg, New York. And when we open again, I highly recommend that all of you come visit. We have a beautiful play, beautiful office. Um, we like to do a bunch of fun activities like seining. Um, and you can come see all of our different critters in our tanks. We have turtles, fish, eels, a lot of it. Um, but one day, my boss, he was leaving on a Friday and he was looking for our yellow eel. It wasn't this specific yellow eel. This was a few years back, but he was looking for our yellow eel in the tank and he couldn't find it. He was looking for a long time and he just assumed that maybe it was underneath some rocks, didn't wanna be found, it was just hiding. And so he went home for the weekend, came back on Monday morning, he went into the, the tank room again um, to check to see for the, for the yellow eel. And what he found was what looked like a piece of beef jerky in the middle of the floor, just dried out little eel. <laughs> and so he was curious. This, this eel was out here three days in, without any water, right? So he was curious what would happen. And so he picked it up and threw it back in the tank. And within a few hours, it was completely rehydrated and normal, like nothing ever happened. So they can go from beef to a real eel again. <laughs> so it's really, uh, really resilient species is what it's called. They can withstand a lot um, and still survive. But great question. Um, what else do we have? What are yellow eels main predators? That's a great question too. So yellow eels main predators, I would say a lot of yellow eels are actually caught um, when people are fishing. Uh, they don't mean to be fishing for yellow eels, but they end up being caught on their hooks for one reason or another. Um, but usually they're just thrown back, you know, not exactly predators. Um, but actually something really cool that I've just learned about, I was researching, um, eels relationship with Native Americans and it, Native Americans actually consumed eels a lot more, um, than what I thought. It was actually one of their main food sources. Um, so that was really cool to learn about that these eels have been here for so long and, uh, people used to live off of them, which was really cool. Um, but actually I have a great picture here on my handy dandy little poster. So here we have a great blue heron um, with an eel in its mouth. And so one of the biggest predators for yellow eels are great blue heron or other fishing fish like kingfishers or uh, bald eagles even, um, a whole bunch of different birds. Um, but the predators for other life stages of the eels, so um, elvers and glass eels, opens up a lot more because they're, they're tiny little snacks, you know, even the elvers. They're, if, I'm, if I'm a big fish, if I'm a striped bass swimming around, I mean, doesn't this just look delicious? You know, a great little snack. <laughs> and same with the glass eels. I mean, I could gobble up a few of those, you know, it'd be great. <laughs> So eels, are, they have a very important role in the ecosystem and within food webs. Um, they are a great source of food and they're also really great at eating. <laughs> Do people catch and cook eels? Smoked eel is popular. Smoked eel is very popular. Um, and essentially, um, I know that people can catch and cook eels in places like Maine. Um, but it's actually, I'm not sure if it's illegal to catch eels for personal consumption, but I know that it is illegal to catch eels for um, reselling them. Um, but I'm not exactly sure. I think that it's still looked down upon, at least in New York State, to catch and cook eels. Um, I'm not 1000% sure. I know smoked eel is very popular, and I know a lot of people that have actually had eel, and 
I'm a little jealous, but I also think that I'd feel pretty bad eating an eel. I've never tried to eat eel sushi. Um, but I'm not, I don't think that around here at least people are catching eels to cook. Um, partly because of the different chemicals that could be in the eels because of our waterways, um, but also probably because I don't think we're allowed to here. Yeah. Great questions though, thank you so much. Um, but yeah, in New York State at least, it is illegal to catch eels commercially. Um, and what actually happens is, so I've been mentioning um, the eel sushi, right? So what actually happens is these illegal poachers um, or totally legally in places like Maine or in Nova Scotia even, um, people catch glass eels the same way we do for our um, eel project. And they ship them off to places like China, Japan, where they grow into yellow eels. And then they are processed into sushi and packaged and then shipped back over to New York State, right where they came from, um, for people to eat here. So they also go through a crazy commercial life cycle as well. Um, it's very big and connects a lot of people. <laughs> Do we have any more eel questions at all? Or Yeah, also remind people, if you want to, you can unmute yourself and ask questions or give comments. Uh, you don't have to use the chat box. How many glass eels have you caught during the eel project? So this is a uh, interesting question. I could answer it in multiple different ways. Um, I can't tell you how many we've caught yet this year um, because we're still catching and I'm also not checking. So we have eight sites open right now. I am personally overseeing four of them. And I can say from the four sites that I'm involved with, we have probably caught close to 10,000 eels probably, if not more, if not 20,000 so far. Um, and I don't even know how the other sites are doing. Um, so there is a lot of them. Yes, the, uh, she's gonna keep showing off for us, keep trying to escape. <laughs> um, but yeah, there are a lot of eels in the Hudson River. And for example, so you guys, well, we're in New Paltz or close to New Paltz at least. Um, and I don't know if you guys have heard, but there's a site called Black Creek, um, close to New Paltz, close to Poughkeepsie. Um, and last year for one day, in one day, in 24 hours, they caught 32,000 eels in, in a singular day. <laughs> it was the most eels, it was the most eels that we've ever seen before um, for this project, but it was amazing because it does mean that eel numbers are continuously rising, which is great to see. Um, they, I believe they used to be endangered and are no longer. Um, and I don't even know if they are threatened anymore either. Um, but it is great watching these eels come back every single year. I've been helping with the eel project for five years now. This is my fifth. Um, and it is just amazing to see. So we have another question, catch and release. How do you know we're not recatching? So that's a great question. Um, so we do do a catch and release system. Um, um, but when we do release the eels, we release them upstream past, bar past barriers. Um, so that they can continue on their migration and they won't be stuck at any dams um, or anything like that. So we release them a uh, quite a distance away. And the way that we know that we're not recatching is um, like what I said before, they like to go against the current. And so if we release them upstream, they won't turn around and go back and then back and forth again. Um, and so they'll just continue going upstream until they find their nice little habitat to settle down and be a yellow eel in for a while. What happens to the eels you catch in nets? So here's our process. So we enter the site um, and we go through what's called a fike net. And basically it's a very big Y and it's a funnel that catches eels in a little trap end. And 
we go through the trap, remove all the eels from there, um, and count them, weigh a small subset of them or a small portion of them, um, and then release them further upstream. And so they continue on. Um, and how far up into Black Creek do they go? They could go all the way, I mean, even to the end. Um, they go through all different kinds of, it's called tributaries that lead into the Hudson. So first they enter the Hudson and then it's kind of, they just kind of disperse into all the different water veins leading into the Hudson. And they go as far as they'd like to. I think that one of the biggest things that helps them determine where to go is smell. Um, they have really great noses. And so I think, well, what I'm thinking is, especially places like Black Creek, so many eels are going there because it smells like home, it smells like everybody else. Um, and so it also leads into this next question, how sensitive are eels to environmental degradation? Very sensitive because of their noses. It could throw off all of these different chemicals being thrown into the Hudson, including sewage, um, either throws off their sense of smell or creates some kind of bias towards a different area. So example, for an example, if they like the smell of sewage and they like the smell of those excess nutrients being dumped into the water, they'll probably go in more um, degraded areas than more clean areas that could have a better environment for them, better food for them. Um, and so they are very susceptible to it. And it happens in multiple ways. It's not just chemicals entering the Hudson River. It's also uh, habitat loss, you know, the creations of dams. Also, um, there's new studies coming out that even hydropower um, hurts these eels a lot because there are uh, specific kinds of uh, hydroelectric turbines that actually attract eels into this spinning blade that is creating the energy. And so the water is rushing through the blade, but because eels like to go against the water currents, they actually swim from the other way right into the blade. Um, and so it's a continuous process of protecting these eels, figuring out what humans need, but also how to help the eels with that as well. Um, and you know, cleaning up the Hudson River has also been a really big part of it. And it's been, the Hudson has been worked on for years and years now, and it's in the most healthiest state it's ever been in. So I think that also shows with our uh, increase in eels that we've found in the Hudson River. Um, so we're really just trying to keep everything safe for all, all species, not just eels, but a healthy river is a healthy ecosystem. And so, yeah, what's best for the eels is best for everybody else. Okay, any final questions? We'll, and then we'll start wrapping up the program. Um, I'll start talking, you can start typing. I know it takes a second to get those typed questions in. I wanna thank Kate for, and her eels for coming and doing this program. Uh, oh, here we go, another question. Do lamprey or lamprey and American eels coexist? Do they live? I have to, I have to look up a photo of lamprey for a minute. I know that I've heard that name, but in order to give you an answer. And Amanda, if you have any, uh, input on any of these questions. Amanda is great. She knows even more than I do about eels, I bet. Um, and I really appreciate her being here. Yeah, I think Amanda maybe lost yeah. her Wi-Fi connection. I don't see her. Ah, okay. Another person who might be able to answer this if he's still on the call is Steve, who did a yeah. program for us earlier this week. Mm, awesome. Um, so if you're listening, Steve, and you have an answer, here he is. Hi. Uh, yes, they, hi everybody. Yes, they coexist, although the sea lamprey has the opposite life story the, of the eel. The sea lamprey is born in freshwater and swims out to the ocean, uh, and that's where it spends most of its adult, li adult life. 
when they come back into the tributaries into fresh water, they don't eat. So they wouldn't be competing with eels, uh, at least as adults when they come back. And I think when they're young, they also don't, uh, they probably aren't likely to compete either there. Although I'm not sure about that. They're more, uh, uh, they, they feed on different things, I believe, but I'd have to check that. But as, as adults, they don't compete. Very cool. Yeah. And, and you bring up a good point. So a lot of catadromous fish or a lot of fish that spend half their life in fresh and half their life in salt, their life in salt, um, they have the exact opposite life cycle of eels. So like Steve was saying, the lamprey, as well as salmon, other species, all of these other species are actually having their babies, their young, in the Hudson River then going out into the big bad ocean and then coming back in to uh, lay more eggs or spawn again. Um, and it's very interesting that eels have a backwards life. And I think personally, I mean, if I was a fish, I'd rather have my babies in the Hudson where, it's, where they're protected than in the big bad ocean where they could be slurped up like a, like a, like ice cream, you know? <laughs> um, but I think they probably do that, first of all, because eels are such an historic species. They've been along for so long. I bet it smells like thousands of generations of eels here. So I bet it smells exactly like home, right where they belong. But also, these glass eels, I don't know how well they would survive in the ocean. <laughs> I mean, they have great camouflage. You know, what's better camouflage than being invisible? But I think these glass eels and even these elvers um, will probably need a lot more protection than just the eggs. And that's probably why they, they have the backwards lifestyle that they do. But that's great. Thank you so much, Steve, for the information about sea lamprey. All right. So once again, any final questions, you can type them in. Uh, once again, thank you, Kate, for coming in. Thank you to everyone else who contributed uh, some facts. Uh, if you're interested, actually, Steve did, disclaimer, Steve is my dad. <laughs> he did a program for us earlier this week on Tuesday on Spring in the Hudson. That is recorded and up on our YouTube channel. So you can actually go and watch that if you're interested in learning more about uh, some of the species on the Hudson that are starting to uh, complete their life cycles, both uh, plants and animals. That's up on our channel and there is a video. I will link to it in a follow-up email for this program. He did have a video of glass eels. Uh, someone went below the water and took a video of them. So if you're interested in seeing them in their natural habitat, that's there. Um, so I will link to that. I will link to the Estuarine Research Reserve and Nori Point and Black Creek in that follow-up email as well if you're interested in visiting and learning more. Black Creek is a great place to go and take a walk just in general. So I encourage that. That's from Cena Cusson. So once again, thank you to everyone who came out. Thank you to Kate. Um, we will be having Kate and the Research Reserve back this summer for summer reading. So look out for more programming coming up. Uh, summer reading is Tales and Tales. That's the theme. Uh, so hopefully uh, we'll see you around for another program coming up. Um, I will link one more time in our chat signing up for our newsletter, uh, which is one of the best ways to find out what programming is coming up at the library. Um, you can find that link on our website. You can find more information about programs on our web calendar, which is also on our website. And you can like us on Facebook and Instagram. You can find us there uh, to learn more about programming. So we're going to say goodbye to Kate and her eels. And I hope you guys have a great rest of your Sunday. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. Thank you guys so much. <laughs>